It's time to take command with former NFL tight end Logan Paulson and former Commander's Beat reporter Craig Hoffman. What's up? What's happening? Welcome in. It's the Take Command podcast. That is Logan Paulson. I am Craig Hoffman. And with us for the full show today, how lucky are we to have Charles Davis from the NFL Network, a part of their draft coverage all the way through the NFL Draft, which, of course, you can watch on the NFL Network. You got uh, Paths of the Draft nightly at 6. You got Total Access at 7. Charles, now your bosses are happy. I have plugged the programming. Welcome to the show, sir. Thank you very much. Yes, you. Now we are okay for liftoff. All right. Before that, <laughs> one runway until all the announcements were in. You guys fly a lot. I fly a lot. My biggest question with my airline people, I have to admit it, is the incessant announcements. Mm, yeah. And have you noticed when the when the pilot comes on and announces they've started the initial descent, everyone buckle up, start returning things, etc. Go three, two, one, and then a flight attendant comes on and says, the <laughs> and I've not figured that part out yet. <laughs> but anyway. I think, Charles, when we fly to Detroit next week, we should just ask our flight attendants. Be like, hey, ma'am, I, or sir, I have, I have a question for question. you. I have a question. You know, you know what we ought to do? We ought to pull 10 of them, and I bet you we'll get seven to eight ants. Seven to eight ants. <laughs> Guaranteed. I, I think we should both ask. We got at least because I mean, uh, Logan's Logan's staying put in Ashburn for this, I'm one, but I'm headed close. to Detroit on Thursday. You're headed to Detroit. That's at least four flights. I don't know if you have any connections to get there. I'm I'm well, luckily so we'll straight through. Out. So we'll talk afterwards and see what right. we get. Compare compare <laughs> notes. I love it. Um, all right, so we we're gonna start comparing notes. Uh, we will eventually compare notes on corner, uh, linebacker, some positions that we haven't talked about a ton leading up to this process, but certainly ones that Washington is going to be looking at. Of course, Charles uh, played safety back in the day, so the DB's right up his alley, uh, but certainly capable of breaking down every position uh, in this draft. But I wanted to start with kind of a bigger picture uh, conversation uh, about the draft. And uh, Alec Lewis wrote a really good piece in The Athletic about draft strategy and how teams have spent a lot of time researching like what they should do and they know that they are supposed to trade back and that more picks is better and yet they still on draft day can't help themselves they'll trade up and sometimes it works because sometimes you trade up for Patrick Mahomes but uh, more often than not there are certain things that teams know they should do they can't help themselves and one of the things that we had Alec on the radio show and, and he said he thinks one of the biggest advantages that a team can have this time of year is an owner with a long term thinking. And Charles, you've been covering the draft for a long time. Uh, Logan, you've been thinking about it from the, your playing days. And obviously we talk about it at nauseum uh, here from January uh, through April. So I'm just curious for both of you guys. And Charles, we'll start with you kind of the, the Josh Harris era and and how a guy that comes from the finance world, the the this kind of long long-term thinking, how it can be an advantage for the commanders as they uh, they prepare for uh, this draft? Yeah, I think the biggest advantage is simply him being brand new. I mean, people have been looking for a breath of fresh air for a long time, and then you have an owner come in and, you know, I don't know how many things were startling, groundbreaking, earth-shaking in, in moves that he's made already, probably not much of anything, but almost everything was positive because it wasn't Dan Snyder. That's your starting point. The next thing is, if he's got long-term thinking, he's going into this with the idea that he has to have a quarterback out of this. But that's not just because this owner has to have a quarterback that he can squire around town and say, this is my quarterback, a la Sonny Werblin and Joe Namath back in the day, a la Dan Snyder doing that with Robert Griffin III. This is much more, this franchise has to have that leader, has to have that person who is in charge, is the face of the franchise, and gives us good play. That's why you're hearing the reports of Josh Harris sitting in on quarterback meetings, right? Meeting all these quarterback candidates that are coming to town. It's as big a decision as Washington has made in a long time football-wise. And having the long term is a big deal, knowing that it's not just for the amusement of the owner, it's for the franchise, and can we get that person that allows us to get back into winning division championships, playoffs, and getting back to Super Bowls. 
Yeah, 100%. I also think that like when you have that longitudinal vision, you see teams like the Baltimore Ravens, the Pittsburgh Steelers, teams that have been kind of very proactive in keeping the continuity of the organization and like they have a very strong cultural identity which helps it which helps them draft more effectively, right? They can right Charles, they can identify people that say, "Hey, this is what it means to be a Raven. This is what it means to be a Steeler because that doesn't change every 3 years. You're not having to turn over teams, you're not having to turn over personnel and then kind of like keeping, like if you if you're willing to be patient with your head coach and your GM, they can kind of establish this cultural identity. So I do think that that long term benefit is really helpful. And also, I think you know, like Charles was talking about with the quarterback, it's extremely important to have to kind of have that again a long term vision for that player because they're not going to be a final version of themselves in year one. It's like what are they going to be in year three, year four? And I'm not going to punt on this player just because I don't ex- get exactly what I want in year one. So I do think having kind of again a long term vision for the process is extremely important because I think ultimately like the best teams, like the teams I just described, Philadelphia when they were rolling a couple of years ago, they're really good at developing talent internally, and that's a long term process. It's not a short term flash in the pan type of moment moment helps build that culture because again even if i'm really active in free agency bringing in strong players and strong personalities are they perfect cultural fits i don't know till they're in the building here i can kind of build that up from from the foundation to the rafters and i think that again is it all starts with the new ownership and i think that's pretty exciting so and and craig let me just piggyback on that because log has made so many great points i'm going to zero in on patience the word patience Mm -hmm. The Baltimore Ravens went through a stretch with John Harbaugh as a head coach where they went, what, four straight years they didn't make the playoffs or something like that, or they went eight and eight or somewhere in that neighborhood, right? It just wasn't quite up to snuff. And there was a lot of pressure from us media types, right? Look, you know, and you guys know, if you're in the media and you work in the media, you're one, you're part of the media. You always <laughs> We, well, we try really, our best, but yet here we are. Right, but, but you know, you know those people that we work with that go, well, you know, I'm really not part of the media. I'm just kind of, mm-hmm. well, you're part of the media, okay? Right. Just deal with it, right? <laughs> but there's a lot of pressure. Hey, he's not getting it done. He's not getting us to where we used to be. And I know it wasn't easy, but let's face it. That ownership had the hard decisions, had the hard conversations. Do we still think we're headed in the right direction? Do we have to tweak some things to get to where we want to go? Do we have to make some changes in certain things? Am I going to ask my head coach to do some things differently, but I still believe in my head coach? They did all of that. What's been the reward? They're back to being that perennial playoff team again. Last year was a major disappointment because they didn't advance to the Super Bowl. They got to the AFC Championship game. They were good enough to get there. That's what you want to be year in and year out. I love how the Pittsburgh people are all upset with Mike Tomlin. I'm tired of us just – every year Mike Tomlin finishes over 500. Like, that's a big deal. That team last year had no business winning 10 games. None. And they did. Okay? So they do this all the time, and people act like it's no big deal. So, Logan, I think you make such a great point about having the patience, having the understanding. Now, what I tell people all the time is, do you really think Mike Tomlin is happy just being 500? (laughs) 500 every year you really think that's what fuels him at night no they're trying to find a way to get better and get there too but you know something you want to have that or do you want to have one of those organizations where as logan has pointed out every two or three years you're hitting a reset button and you're fighting to get into 500 in the first place thank you i think i think you've made excellent points on that and that's where washington wants to get to no doubt. And I think that also leads to kind of the next thing I wanted to talk about. It's like another branch off this tree, if you will, which is the ability to try stuff and, and kind of be different than other organizations with this new fresh perspective that Josh Harris has. And he's been an owner in other sports. He's been very successful. I, I think that the Sixers uh, for him are kind of a, a different version of, of what you're talking about with the Steelers, Charles, where it's like they win 50 games every year and everyone hates Josh Harris and thinks he's a terrible <laughs> owner in Philly. And I'm sitting here as someone who covers the Wizards as well, being like they haven't won 50 games since 1978. So what are we talking about? <laughs> um, and, and so I think that the ability to, to have tried things in other sports, such as uh, bringing in multiple prospects together. That's kind of the hot topic as we sit here recording this on, on Thursday, April 18th. Uh, yesterday, they brought in all the different quarterbacks together and people are freaking out and you know trying to read uh, uh, what does this emoji that Jaden Daniels' agent tweeted out mean? And it's like, wow, we really have reached the uh, peak of silly season here a week before the draft, haven't we? Um, but, but I think that uh, as we figure out the people, and Logan and I were talking about this a little bit before we started recording, like getting a chance to see 
these quarterbacks interact with each other and see how they are in a lunchroom, see how they are uh, in a meeting room where there's multiple people there. And there's kind of this camaraderie that you want to understand who they are. And you're not just reliant on coaches who have an incentive to get their guy drafted to tell you the truth. And sure, sure you might have good relationships, but you get to see it for yourself. I love that. I love thinking differently because the the draft is, even for the best teams, such a crapshoot. Ozzy Newsom famously will tell you that if you know you want to get seven good players, have 14 picks. It's not about right. trying to target your right ones. It, it like he is someone who lived that multiple pick strategy. So I'm also just kind of curious what you guys think on, on that front, the idea of trying different things. And by the way, Belichick used to bring in a dozen guys. He talked about that on the McAfee show yesterday. So it's not completely new. But doing things differently, being willing to try things and, and you know, that that longitudinal approach where, you know, if you're a GM or a coach and you try something that doesn't work, you're not you don't have the fear that you're immediately then going to get fired uh, because it didn't work in year one. Yeah, let me hop in real quick because I want to get Logan into this one. Logan, I don't want to take you away from where you wanted to go, but I want you to add to this. All right, because it's a question I would have from a person who was in there in locker rooms and saw all of this, right, from the time you came out of college to combines, to workouts, to, you know, your team building, everything that goes along with it. What you were bringing up, Craig, and bringing in these four quarterbacks, my immediate thought was, first, I was a little bit snarky. I was like, oh, boy, this is kind of fun, right? Steel cage match. Whoever emerges <laughs> out of here is going to be our draft pick. Ha, 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 ha. But I thought back to combine situations. I thought back to recruiting trips, okay? I thought back to any group dynamics where you're putting a number of the same type of players or same position players in and seeing how it sifts out. How do people respond to them? How do they respond to each other? Who ultimately shows that he is that person or has that thing that you're looking for depending on what team you're on? So Logan, whatever you want to go, I don't want to take you away from that. I'd love to have you talk about when quarterbacks are coming together, positions are coming together. Because I'll end it with this. There's a great story that George Plimpton, I don't know if you guys know that name. He was a great writer, and he wrote a book about trying out for the Detroit Lions. Yes, yeah. yeah. yeah it was called Paper Lion back, I think it was 1963 or somewhere. Yeah. And he, they tried to sneak him into camp and have some cover story. And he was, a, he was a, a writer who was going through the NFL stuff. And he did a lot of these projects. He pitched. He played goalie. He boxed with Archie Moore. He did all those nutty things, right? But it was great writing. It was great journalism. The book I've read more than 10 times. I've loved it. But in that book and then in a subsequent book called Mad Ducks and Bears, he detailed going to the Pro Bowl. And he was on the East, he was with the Eastern Conference Pro Bowl team. Ali Sherman was the coach of the Giants. He coached the team. They didn't have a meeting. They didn't have a depth chart. You'll love this one, Logan. They went out on the field for the first time. Oh, yeah. I've heard this. Yeah. Yep. You heard this story, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. They said, okay, Craig, you're going to love this. Give me the first team offense over the ball. Now, these are the all-stars. This is the best of the best. They all looked at Now, this would have been 1960-something, right? 62, 63, 64, when Alex Sherman was at his heyday. They all looked at each other took the measure of each other, and 11 guys walked out in the right That's position. That's incredible. Yeah. Now, think about nowadays. Now you have a steel cage match going. Okay, I yeah. get all that. But I'm saying they understood who the best was. That feels a lot like what you're trying to do when you're bringing these groups together. Logan, everything you want now that I've gone so long. <laughs> and please, please, if you could try and respond to that part for me because I'm trying to learn too. No, I think that's a great point. And that's something that I think that's what you're looking for, right? Is you're looking when these guys come together. Like I just remember, like I do combine prep, right? Like, and when you go to the, go to the facility, there's a bunch of tight ends. There's a bunch of old linemen. And what I'd like to do is just kind of sit in the room and watch them interact. Like, do they get along? Is anyone standoffish? Is anyone kind of combative? I also love to see when guys start talking ball, like who's the football junkie? Like when, you know, like just as an example, does JJ McCarthy go up to Drake May and be like, hey man, I love how you ran that zone read. Like what were your rules on that? And just trying to digest more football. And like, so you get kind of to peel back the layer of the guy in a way that you wouldn't get if they were in on their individual visit. Because the only person they're talking to, they know is important. But like, 
for example, like you're, you know, at these combine preps or when they would bring guys in before you, they'd sit down at the table. Some guys are super buttoned up. Other guys are laughing and joking and bringing other guys over. Hey man, come on. Sit. I want that type of guy in my room. I want a culture where we're bringing people along and that's a different type of leadership, but that's a type of leadership. And you don't get to see that if I'm by myself, because the only person I'm talking to is Dan Quinn and Adam Peters. And I don't get to be the person I want to be. So I think it just, again, helps kind of open the book on the athlete a little bit. And I've heard stories of guys coming for visits with just the coaches and the coaches like, I never got a feel for who he was as a person. And then they'd bring him in with four or five other guys or they get him in a setting with four or five other guys, whether that's at the combine, right? As pro day. And it's like, that's who he is. And so I think this setting, you know, taking him out to dinner with a bunch of guys, taking him to top golf or whatever they did, that's super important for seeing the person. And seeing what type of guy you're bringing in and see if it gets compatible with the culture you have in the building. So I think it's extremely important. And Logan, when you, when you see some of these things, because sometimes when these guys come together, there's often that little bit of, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to be the one, right? Yeah. More times than not, in my experience, that person who's emerged as the guy didn't have to work at it. He just mm. was. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think, I no, think that's sure. right. I think the other point there that Charles brings up is like, what is your demeanor when you're in the, like, cause this is a competitive situation, right? Can you still be a good teammate while also knowing, having the, the self-assured confidence that you're the guy? So I think that's exactly right. Like it's what, it, those are only interactions you get in when they're all together. And I don't care what position, where they're from. I don't get that if I'm just talking to you one-on-one. -on -one. I get that when I'm sitting back, I'm Dan at, at the event and I'm watching how you talk to each other and how you interact. So I think that's why this is such a cool, cool thing. And I, and you know, people are kind of saying that it's new, but I, I mean, Charles, when I was playing, Craig, when I was playing, like I remember them doing that all the time. You'd be in a workout, they'd be trotting guys through the weight room for their weigh-ins, talking to the strength coach. You're like, Oh, I guess it's the 30 visit day and there's 15 guys <laughs> there. So I, it doesn't seem like that new to me, but whatever. No, I don't, no. I don't think it's new at all. Logan, I think you made a great point. I can't remember if it was you or Craig talked about Bill Belichick talked about how he would bring in those groups of people. Everyone does different things with group dynamics, but for all future players who are going to go to the combine and Logan, I need you to either tell me if I'm way off track or if I'm somewhere in the neighborhood, if you're going to the combine, one thing you will be evaluated on is how you are in group dynamics. When you think no one's watching you, whether 1, you're having thousand percent, whether, whether you're going down the hall to go meet with other teams, whether you were on time for all that, and then, hey, excuse me, sir, I have to go because I have to be at such and such place. Or during the combine workout itself, mm -hmm. coaches love to have everybody because it's your group. The tight ends are working out. The DBs are working out. The offensive linemen are working out. Yes, you're there for you. But these coaches want to see you help someone else. They want to see you do the right thing for someone else. They want to see how that group responds and see if all of a sudden there's four or five guys clustered around one other person. Is yeah. that that person? Who is that guy? That's that's These are all the things that go into it. Does it always predict it accurately? Not always, but I'd say more times than not. Yeah. No, yeah, I absolutely. agree. And I think like you look at like Roma Dunze. Sorry, Craig. You look at Roma Dunze. You're on the field for this, Charles. You know, but Roma Dunze, when he's doing his drill work, and I think he's, he's still going, isn't he? Yeah, but he's like he's like <laughs> like even even when he's running routes, like he's dapping people up. People are supporting him there, and like he's bringing people with him. And I want to see that. And you talk to people that night going out to dinner or whatever, and they're like, "Oh, so and so receiver, they were rude to the nurse at the hospital today." And I don't want that guy here. And you're like, so they're always paying attention, they're always watching, but because you're, it's the the stuff on the field is important. But ultimately, how's that guy going to be in the building? And like you said, you only see that in these group setting interactions. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. I'm going to stop with Odunze, but my joke about Odunze is he's still going. <laughs> you guys remember, he wanted a standard for himself at that mm. combine. And remember, he ran his three cone and did not like his time. Yeah. And he kept doing it and doing it and doing it until he hit his time. This, 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 is, this, is, this is someone now. We just left the Masters, right? And what do they say about golfers? You don't play against other golfers. You play against the the, the course. Yeah. That was Madunze playing the course. It's pretty impressive. Absolutely. Yeah, no doubt about it. And I, I've certainly, in my reporting days, had position coaches and personnel execs say the same thing. Like, I want to know who that leader is in the group. Like, who's the guy that breaks down the, the wide receiver group? Who's the guy that breaks down the quarterback group? Like, they pay attention. But I will say this real quick, because I do feel like sometimes we can get really into the personnel dynamics. 
it's a part of the evaluation. And that's what I think fans need to remember is if the commanders hated a guy's tape at quarterback, let's say for the number two pick, mm. and they thought he wasn't very good, but he's awesome in the building, they're not going to draft him. So no. it, it's not like this overrides everything else, but it's a piece of the evaluation. And I, Logan, as we've talked about quarterback, especially over the last month and kind of thrown our hands up going, I have no idea who they should take because we like certain elements of all of the three main guys in competition here. Um, there is like th this personnel dynamic might wind up being the deciding factor, but it's only because everything else is even. If this is this is a tiebreaker, this is an important part of the the evaluation, but it's not the entire evaluation. It's an element. Look, we all played ball. We all did things growing up, right? You remember that senior who could barely get his pads on, but some but he was named captain yeah, because yeah. you know he's a senior and he's a good guy and he was named captain. So sometimes, we, to your point, Craig, we get caught up in things. Sometimes, like how many times we go through this. Well, the starting quarterback in the NFL doesn't have the C on his jersey. Mm. Oh, my God. Sometimes it can be too much, right? But, <laughs> yeah, he, yeah, he doesn't because he's a rookie, okay? So <laughs> don't slap it on him because he's a rookie. Now, some of them earn it. C.J. Stroud earned it in about two days in Houston. Some of them have to grow into it. I remember a player in this league, a big-time player, and I'm not going to use his name because it's not fair to him, but he was named a captain. And then when a new coach came in, he took the captaincy from him because he said, you're just not there yet. You know, that couldn't be easy for him. But it's just all a matter of the process of what people are looking for and sometimes earning it, not earning it. So, Craig, I think you make a great point. It's a part of it. And by the way, that player got the captaincy taken from him. His play didn't decline. He was still mm -hmm. a terrific football player and probably was even a little more ticked off because they took the C <laughs> from him. But all that being said, it's a, it's a part of the evaluation. It isn't a total evaluation. We have to make sure we understand the context of all this that goes into it. You're exactly right. The greatest guy ever who can't throw it 10 yards is not your starting quarterback. No, certainly not the number two pick. No, not even, <laughs> not even undrafted free agent because if Logan Paulson's going out and running, for, run out, running routes for passes and Charles Davis can't reach him throwing the football, then Charles Davis needs to go home. Okay. <laughs> okay. I think Charles Davis can go to the broadcast booth, though. I heard he's pretty good at that. He's pretty good. <laughs> he, yeah. needs, he needs to take it and take it to the house because we're wasting Logan Paulson's time. All right. Anyway. <laughs>All right, let's get into some player evaluations now. This will probably be more tape because I don't know. Unless Charles, have you been doing uh, you conducting the Charles Davis interview sessions here? Do we get do we get the Charles Davis group interview sessions? <laughs> Listen, I'm he I'm here for whatever way you want to go about doing this bad boy. I will do my best to try and keep up with the two of you. Okay. All right, all right. That's en that's enough of that. Uh, let's get into corner. Um, but yeah. because this is a position that Logan, I think when we've done our mocks. We, we kind of get to 36 with the commanders. We get through the first round. We get to their first pick of the second. And it seems like the best player available often is a corner. And then it's yeah. like, okay, do you want one of these second-tier tackles? Do you want a corner? Do you want mm -hmm. a receiver? There's always receivers because that's the nature of this draft. But we okay. haven't really dove into the cornerback position yet. So, Charles, I'm curious for you. Like, Do you have uh, uh, just a uh, your top five ready-at-the-go corner rankings? Who are some of the guys you like? Maybe some guys that uh, a lot of people like that are high on kind of the consensus boards that you're not as high on for whatever reason. Okay, let's just go go with it. It's not exactly a, a firm number, but listen, Terry and Arnold from Alabama, Quinion Mitchell from from Toledo, um, Cooper DeGene from from Iowa, and he's a very interesting case study because yes. well, you mix bag across the board about where people want to play him, but everyone knows they want to play him. So that's right. the thing. To keep in mind. Everybody wants him, just a matter of where they want to put him, right? Kool Aid McKinstry from Alabama, um, Nate Wiggins from Clemson. You'll hear those names a lot is about, about your consensus five. But then you get beyond that. Now you're getting into some other things. A lot of people like this Ennis Rakestraw from, from Missouri. Hmm. Problem is he's looking on the slight side, but boy, does he go at it. And I mean, he plays with a fury and is always around the football. But is he a nickel? Mike Sane was still from Michigan. Another kid who's just a playmaker extraordinaire. And again, probably you want to move him more inside the nickel than be an outside corner. This kid, TJ Tampa from Iowa State, is intriguing. Mm. Very intriguing because I think he's got some length. 
I know he's got some coverage ability. He's got some toughness and will come up and tackle. I don't worry about him at all. Then you're into guys like Kamari Lassiter from Georgia, Andrew Phillips from, from, uh, from Kentucky, Renardo Green from Florida State. These are some of the names that continually pop up and bounce around. It's going to be a lot of fun to watch. But all I know is Cooper DeGene, I want him. I'll figure out where I'm going to play him. My only consideration with him is I don't want him to go into Isaiah Simmons syndrome. Remember Isaiah mm. Simmons? Come yeah. Remember he could do everything, right? Yeah. I, call it, I call it whiteboard fever, Logan, because I can take that X and O and I can put it anywhere and it sure looks good. Yeah. But if he hasn't – those and Isaiah Simmons has never mastered anything and has hurt him in his NFL career. I want Cooper DeGene to be able to master some things before I start moving him to each and every spot on the field. Yeah, Cooper DeGene's a pretty special talent. You know, kind of reminds me of like that Honey Badger type vibe where you could put him everywhere, but you kind of hope that he again like settles in and they work on his development. But in that second tier of guys, you mentioned the guys that I think are awesome: Enos Rakestraw, maybe he's a nickel. You know, Mike Sanders still, maybe he's a nickel. Is there a true? outside player in there. You mentioned TJ Tampa. Tampa, I like Kamari Lasser. Didn't test as well as people thought, right? But is there an outside guy that you say, hey, this guy's a difference maker for a defense? Because the commanders right now, at least on paper, have a lot of nickel type body types. They don't have that true outside guy to kind of support Benjamin St. Juice and Emmanuel Forbes. Is there somebody you're in there like, man, if I'm going to take a shot on somebody at 36 or 40, this could be your outside dude here. Max Melton Rutgers. You know what's I'm gonna you know you know you know who Fred Smoot is? Do you know him at all? Have you bumped into him? I know Fred Smoot. He he has been everybody knows who Smoot is and they can hear him. Yeah, he has (laughs) been touting Max Milton. He has been touting Max Milton for the last month. So you just made his day, by the way. But anyway, talk about Max Milton a little bit. If if Fred if Fred's touting him, then I feel like I'm on the right track. (laughs) Fred's in the head. All right. Um Melton, you know, we always talk about bloodlines, right? And sometimes yeah. bloodlines work, sometimes they don't, right? But, for, you know, we, we love it when a bloodline comes through. His brother was an undrafted free agent. Now he's with Green Bay and is starting to make his mark. And one thing about both Meltons, they can fly, all mm-hmm. right? And there's something – look, speed isn't everything because the top 10 ever combined times, mm-hmm. all right, running the 40, probably about seven or eight of them never really made a mark, okay, so as far as football players. But this kid, toughness out on the corner, went up against some big time competition. Because remember, Rutgers in the Big Ten now, so he had to deal with he had to deal with Ohio State and and, and Harrison and, and and all the great receivers there, Buka and all the rest of them there. He had to deal with Michigan, right? He had to deal with all the big time guys that come out there and stretch the field and willowy and are willing to block and the whole deal. There's a toughness to him, and he's one of those guys that both of you know in this draft process. The scouting side's one thing. But when the coaches get involved, now things really get interesting. Yeah. And coaches love this kid. Absolutely mm-hmm. love him. There's a toughness element to him that I really like. And I think he's going to go – obviously, he's going to get drafted unlike his brother. But I really like him as an outside corner. Yeah, and how would you compare him to a guy like TJ Tampa? A guy, I'm really high on TJ Tampa. I like him a lot. Like, how do you how do you bucket them? And like, where do you say, oh, stylistically, Max Milton does this really well, while TJ Tampa is more of this type of player? Melton is going to be your speed guy, mm. and everything's going to be like, hey, here's the here's the fast guy, go get him. Mm. DJ Tampa, technique, coverage, understanding what's going to happen before the ball's ever snapped. Reminds me a little bit, and you know, we get into these comps, and after yeah. a while, people take the comp and, and, and want to just beat people over the head with it. <laughs> the reason Richard Sherman was so great, in my humble opinion, all right, was that he understood what you couldn't do before the ball was snapped mm. and narrowed down what you could do and made educated understandings before every single snap. And the second part, he took no false steps. Mm. Richard wasn't a blazer. Logan, right. you know. I mean, if you put Richard in a 40, that's not, that's not his thing. But come game day, <laughs> good luck running yeah. your route, right? So that's where I see more of a TJ Tampa understanding those things, being in the right spot, and is going to make sure he's he's there for each and every play because he knows what you can't do based on mm. your split, formation, what's going on before the ball snap. Is there one of those guys that when you look at uh, what Dan Quinn and, and Joe Witt Jr. have done, uh, Dallas is obviously the most recent example, but I guess you could go back to 
uh, Richard and, and everyone that uh, DQ had in Seattle, uh, but but also Joe Witt's uh, lengthy career as a DB's coach. Um, is there anybody in that group that stands out? And we can put throw the nickel guys back in there, Rake Strauss, Andrew Still, et cetera, that really fits. Uh, and you go, that's, that's a Dan Quinn, that's can a I'm, Joe Witt type of player. Can I make a comment ahead. real quick here? Yeah, so the thing that is tough about, because everyone asked me that same question. The thing that's tough about this question is that he has transitioned and evolved with the type of corner that he's looking for. So he went from, you know, these tall, angular corners. And so you say, oh, Kyrie Jackson or Cam Hart would fit that mold right. perfectly. But then you get to Atlanta and he's got smaller, shiftier, kind of faster, more ball skill type players. Then you get to Dallas. And I don't really think there's like a common thread with that group outside of maybe college ball production, you know, which again is super important, but also they have – they anticipate the football well. They do all these different things. You know, like even um, like Andrew Phillips from Kentucky is a is a guy that is a dog and has this dog mentality, but doesn't have the ball ball production. So I know Dan likes that competitive edge to a player, but is the ball production there? So it's it's a tough question to answer because there's been an evolution to his defensive system, and I think that's why like. I just wanted to give you an out there, Charles, if you needed one. So just give me a softball. <laughs> yeah, now answer the question, Charles. Forget everything <laughs> Logan said. <laughs> I appreciate it. Logan's right about the evolution, yeah, which tells sure. you that he's a good coach. Yeah. Because good coaches are always supposed to deal with what you have in front of you. What is my what is my talent? What do they do best? And then you shape your your schemes around them. I do think that what he's evolved into, maybe I'm wrong. He wants ball hawks, ball hawks, ball yeah. hawks. He doesn't care what size, shape, form they come in. He wants those guys to go make plays on the football, go after the football and get it. Whether, you know, a San still fits that bill perfectly at a nickel at a nickel slot. If you go to the outside, Quinion Mitchell had that big year yeah. at, at Toledo. And a lot of people dinged him because he had five or six picks that one year. And he had a bunch of them in one game. And then next year he only had one. Did you see the number of throws that came his way yeah. and how much he dropped? So his, his opportunity to do it, he's a kid He's very confident. When you watch him and you guys have seen him, how many times have you seen him where you said, oh, my God, he's lined up at 10 yards deep all the time? Yeah. He lines up at 10 and wants you to come to him. Yeah. He'll run with you anywhere you want. And if you're going to stop short, he's like a dart and coming up to make a play. They may change some of that with their coverages and all. But Quinion Mitchell, to me, feels like the kind of kid that, that, that fits that bill of Trayvon Diggs. Yeah. You know? of what he had in Dallas, who was his most recent ball hawk and played really well. And then who was it last year who had the incredible year with yeah. the big six? Yeah, Josh Bland. Bland. Yeah. Bland, there we go. There Bland. We go. So, so that's what I think that Dan has kind of evolved into. I don't care the shape, size, or whatever. If you're going to make plays on the ball, I'm going to find a way to get you on the field. Yeah, it's interesting. When you were describing Max Milton and his kind of instincts, I was like, oh, that's kind of sounds like a guy that Dan would like. But is there any – because, you know, obviously Quinion Mitchell is – he's my number one rated quarter. So I think he's going to be gone probably in the top 15 picks. Is there somebody else that maybe people don't know about, if you can check your notes, that has a lot of ball production that's a guy that, you know, maybe people aren't super familiar with, just to kind of put you on the spot here? Well, I think it's going to be interesting to see because we're way down into the weeds. Oh, and we're in the weeds. We're in the weeds. Oh, I don't think it's 36, okay? All yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Talking much more day three. Yeah. Mm. This kid from West Virginia, Beanie Bishop, mm. go check his ball production, Logan. Yep. Check, check his testing. He didn't get invited to the combine, so he went to the Big 12 combine. And I got to hear from you a second. He ran 439. Mm. Okay? Mm. Measurements, measurables. 5'9", 180, 439, which is a big reason why he's going to go on day three and late. But ball production's really good. Okay, Love you it. go back and watch this kid. 20-something passes broken up. All those things that go into it. I've always said production is such a big deal. Remember Jimmy Moreland coming out of James Madison? Remember that? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. He was picked and stuck. It was production in college. I think he had like 16 picks and 40-something passes broken up. Amik Robertson from Louisiana Tech, another small school guy, went to the Raiders. His his ball production is the same way. And Kevin Byard come out of Middle Tennessee State, another kid who did not get – not a kid now, he's a full-grown man. But at that time, he didn't get an invite to the combine. He's just down the road from the Titans. They, they went and saw him. He had him in the third round. You know what the big attraction was? 19 interceptions in yeah. college. Ball production. Yeah, no, without a doubt. And I think the other thing that's interesting too about corner in the modern NFL is that we talk about the body types. 
their body types of receivers have changed. No longer are the outside guys just the 6'3", six, 6'4", six, big, prototypical X body types. Like, you got those guys now that are playing inside, like, power slot positions. So all of a sudden, you need size inside versus outside. And so that, that just makes the mixing and the matching of the skill sets uh, and the body types and, and all that stuff all the more interesting and, I guess, harder if you're a, if you're a team that's trying to, trying to make a fit here. Um, but I, I do think that that needs to be discussed when you're talking about core corner is who they're covering where on the field is just different than it was 10 years ago. It certainly is. And look, you, you guys have both been around it for so long. The adage is true. You build your team to win your division first. Okay. Mm-hmm. If you win your division first, you're in the playoffs and off you go. Now, if you get multiple years of success in doing that, now you can kind of cast your eyes upward a little bit. Who are we going to have to deal with in the playoffs? that gives us trouble. And can we add that person to it? All right. So if you were in the AFC during Tom Brady's heyday, when you when you got good enough to say, OK, we think we're going to make the playoffs. But if we run into the Patriots, you have someone who's going to deal with Gronk. Mm-hmm. Right. That was someone you would add to your to your arsenal during that time. Now, truth of the matter is, could anybody truly deal with Gronk? <laughs> <laughs> but you were trying your best to figure it out. And you guys saw. Everyone tried everything. And one of the pivotal plays in the Super Bowl against Seattle, they put him, they flipped him on the backside of the formation and split him out to the nub side. And Seattle trotted out K.J. Wright, who's a terrific football player. But all of a sudden, K.J. Wright went from being a terrific outside linebacker to now K.J. Wright's a corner. And guess who won that battle? Remember, (laughs) they hit Gronk right in the corner of the end zone right before the half on a one-on-one. That's the type of thing that you're looking for to have those people can be versatile. Seattle didn't have it for that 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 formation or that position, and ended up hurting them and helping cost them the game. Well, I'm really glad you brought that up because I think you know one of the things about Dan when you look at Dallas specifically is it's compiled of all these guys like kind of converted safeties that now play linebacker, play safety that are these more flexible, more fungible body types. And I think that's one of the things about evaluating the safety specifically in this class that you say to yourself like, wow, there's a lot of guys that could be this kind of tweener star hybrid linebacker type player that's kind of sweeping the NFL. And I, and I say to myself like, th- those are skill sets that you've seen Dan recently really, really covet. Are there any safeties? Maybe, you know, they're not, not the top guys. I think we're pretty familiar with the top guys at this point, but you say bigger body type that kind of fits that, that curse role from Dallas last year, that 6'4 safety that's 215 that yeah. can match yeah. can match a tight end, but also play a little bit a little bit of deep coverage. Yeah. Uh, there's this kid at Oregon State, Katana yeah, Holodopo. Yeah, big big old <laughs> hoss. Big old hoss, a, yeah. Man, he may very well end up being more of the Marquise Bell, Logan. Yeah, right. That's that's a great – yes, great point. Right? Great point. A lot more linebacker than that. But if you're talking about those guys who are a little more willowy and we can, and we can get, them, get them involved in that, I'm eager to see – he's more of a center fielder right now, but Caleb Bullock from USC. Oh, yeah. I want to see if they can get a little bit more heft on him in yeah. order to place those things. But right now he's a little bit more of the center fielder for you. I pulled out my notes here to pull them up because I love your question. Um but the Bullard, while, while you're looking, I'll I'll talk while you're while you're looking because yeah, about Caleb, Bullard from Poland. Have you watched dude, him? Yeah, he's great. Like kind of that box player, not a tall guy, but you know, like no, kind of has that ability to kind of compact yeah. and can Go cover ahead. a little bit. Looked at look good at the Senior Bowl. I think there's a lot of player, and that's why the safety position is fun to me because like. Bo Bright was an okay college player, but you watch him at the senior bowl and say, hey, that's, that's, he's matching up pretty good in the slot. You watch him fit a run, you say, oh, that's kind of a good block destruction technique. And so there's much more kind of dynamic athletes at the safety position than there ever has been because they're asked to do so much different stuff in college football. So it's kind of one of those positions where it's like, man, this is really interesting who, who this new organization values and what they value for sure. So. That is so true, but there's so many of the guys who are rated high at the top of the safety position, Logan and Craig, that are one or the other. Like we've mm, been talking yes, about yeah. the guys. The safety position this year is much more defined by this guy's That's a, a great boxing point. center fielder. And I was struck by that going through things because Cole Bishop from Utah is one of my favorite players. Right? Love I love Cole Bishop. Absolutely love him. Do I believe he can be a center field safety? I do. I absolutely do. 
But the best plays you see him do on, do on tape, he's a box guy. Right. He's up there. He's near the line of scrimmage. He makes plays. He helped himself greatly in the combine when he ran 4-4-5. Four, because four, mm -hmm. I don't think I saw him as a 4-4-5 four, four, guy because most of his stuff's been near the line of scrimmage. The two from Georgia for both mm. of you, Tyke Smith, Javon Bullard, all right? Both went to the Senior Bowl and both had kind of defined roles that they wanted to do the other. Tyke mm. Smith been more of the nickel safety underneath, covering things. Javon Bullard's been more of the back of back. Of that. Both of them came to the Senior Bowl and wanted to do the opposite. Mm. They wanted to show the scouts and show people they could play the other positions. In tandem, they were quite the duo at the University of Georgia. I thought they were terrific. One of my favorite players on tape, there's two guys that I really love on tape. Jaden Hicks from Washington. Ooh, great pull by you. Great so, pull. Yeah, no, that's one of Logan's guys. All love right. Guy. And Malik Mustafa from Wake Forest. You like hitters, man. I like the hit. Listen, it's not just that. You turn on the tape. It's like the old school baseball when Babe Ruth hit the home run and goes around the bases in a furious, right? You know, <laughs> that's how both of them play. Yeah. Like they are played like they are sped up and everyone else is going. And you're exactly right about the hitting. I'm glad, I'm glad that you and I have kind of connected on someone there. But Hicks is just one of those players that if you turn on the tape, you may watch someone else, but you, all your eyes yeah. keep coming to him. Yeah, watching him versus UW is like special. You're like, this guy's playing man on a receiver on Jalen Polk in the slot, and he gets the interception. Oh, they ran a reverse, and he's and he's the and he's the post safety, and he's delivering an absolute blow, like blowing up guard. Like his film versus UW was incredible. Like I and I just was like, this guy. Why aren't people talking about this guy more? And then Mustafa is a guy that they have him playing at 12 yards, and he's the the C like the eighth man in the box, and absolutely missile like missling to the football and i like i just i think there's value there i know people say oh it's not a physical game anymore like those dudes will play for you and they have a role you know and i think Jaden hicks has a chance to be a difference maker so i think those are great great picks by you guys that have really dynamic skill sets well you know these are guys that listen Jaden hicks would be one of the early safeties i think that would go wouldn't you think logan yeah Craig? I, think I think so one of those guys in whatever number of whatever bushel we put them in Jaden Hicks is going to be good, especially by teams that want to have that, that, that box safety and beat people up that way. Malik Mustafa, I'm eager to see where exactly he's going to go and when because you drafted, when I say you, D.C. drafted Cam Curl a number mm -hmm. of years ago, and I loved him coming out of school. Didn't go as high as many as, as, as I, you know, as of course he would want to go, but was a difference maker pretty early in his career. I feel a lot of the same things with Mustafa I felt with Curl. Just an instinct about playing, understanding the game, being in the right spot. And those guys, they may not get the acclaim they deserve, but guess what? They flat out can play. And now Curl, of course, is in with the Rams. Yeah, for sure. I think something else that's a good reminder uh, for, for everyone is the new kickoff rules probably impact some of these late round safeties as well. And, and these DBs, if you can run a four, four, five and you can blow up blocks and you can, you're a sure tackler because there's going to be kickoff returns now and the style of the new rules, Logan, we talked about this when the new rules pass, like that is a skill set that is going to be coveted on special teams way more now than it ever was in the past decade when every ball went through the end zone. Um, and so that that special teams ability was always something that you look for in your late round picks, but is going to become uh, more important. And if you can get down the field quickly, um, at an actual 40 yard sprint in a football game, uh, it doesn't happen very often, but uh, that, that 20, 30, 40 yard sprint down to, to tackle someone on kickoff all of a sudden uh, is going to be a part of the game uh, for, for these DBs. And for at least a year, if we're starting that kickoff line way up there, yeah, hand-to-hand -hand combat. Yeah. Mm. Who are the guys who can shed and go get someone right away? Because if they can engage you, he's just got to break one wall, and then it's right. nothing but grass. So I think we're going to see a couple of things. Just what you talked about, Craig. We're going to see those types of players get a little more value. We're going to see these – Logan, you've talked about these bigger kids who can play hybrid linebacker safety. And then the linebackers who can run, all of them are going to get a little extra value in terms yeah. of special teams because you've got to shed and make the play there. If you don't make the play there with this one, at least we know for one year, it's a long run. And by the way, I'm predicting that all the kickoff return guys are going to be much bigger people. Mm. The scat guys are going to be on punt returns. 
the big people are going to be on kickoff return because essentially it's like running an ISO. Yeah. You're going to just try to ram your way through that first wall and then off you go. I'm old enough to watch the roller derby. So you, if you win the jam, <laughs> if you win the jam, there you go. Off you're ready to go. And then right back there to get you, you know? So that's what's going to be the fun part of watching all of this. I mean, I was at the owners meeting when they announced the new rule was in for this year and how the new kickoff was going to be aligned. I was sitting with Pat Kerwin. You guys know Pat from, yep. from Sirius XM. Sirius Ray. XM, yep. The former, the former GM, former agent. Pat's done it all, coach. And I was sitting there. They announced the rule, and Pat goes, well, I bet you Cordero Patterson's phone's blowing up. <laughs> sure was. And it wasn't an hour. Cordero Patterson announced that he was signing with the Steelers. Mm. Yep. He that next little chunk of change. A, a but the thing about him was, remember, he was fearless, and he had the green light from nine yards deep. I think he has a 109-yard kickoff yeah, return. Yeah, he does. But he's a big man. Yes. Yeah. That's what. That's why I think we're, we're headed to bigger people on kickoff returns, smaller people on punt returns. That's really interesting. I uh, also wonder a guy like, you know, Antonio Gibson, who just left here for New England, like AG's a big guy and he was on kickoff return here, but never got to do anything because the ball just sailed over his head. Uh, so wonder, get body types like that, uh, which also there's some guys in this draft too that, that, that could certainly fit that build. He fits. He totally fits. That's why I think your point, Craig, about the type of player to make it that extra consideration when you're trying to keep someone. Yep. And Logan has pointed it out. If you can be the hybrid. Mm, yep. Play the safety, the, the, the J-Ron curse. I mean, this, this is what we're all looking for now. And Dan Quinn values the versatility and, and all that. Because now, when you're calling defenses, it used to be you could tell what personnel was coming in, where they were going. Just like the offenses were. 100%. Now, that's it. That, that group can stay on the field. And this guy goes from this spot to that spot. That guy from that spot to this spot. And off you go. We all thought we'd see more of that in Atlanta last year. And we didn't. And that was the major surprise. Remember positionless football? Yeah. Mm-hmm. John's going to be here, 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 here. Pitts is going to be here, 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 here. Drake London's going to be here, 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 here. And it did not translate the way they needed to translate. So they've hit the reset button. I see if Raheem Morris can unlock all of that with Kirk That'd Cousins. Awesome. Back. And I think they've got a good chance of doing it. Without a doubt. All right, we got about five minutes left. I do want to hit uh, linebacker real quick if we can. Yeah. Next, next five minutes you, here. You mean there's linebackers in this draft? Because the way the draft goes, no one's talked about them at all. Yeah. It, it took it took until a week before the draft, Charles, but you found the podcast that's going to do it. We might have squeezed it into five minutes at the end, but the Commanders, they've got, I think they're set for 2024, but 2025 and beyond is, is a pretty blank slate for them because Bobby Wagner's on a one-year deal. Jamin Davis is on the last year of his rookie deal. And so while they've obviously signed Frankie Louvu and, and Jeremy Chin's going to play some in the box and Quan Martin's going to be in the box, you know, some of that positions that we just talked about, those hybrid players, in the long term, like we know that how how impactful a really good linebacker can be in the middle of a defense. And if you're a rookie and want to come be an understudy under someone, who better than Bobby Wagner? So right. uh, once you get past, let's say Peyton Wilson, who's who's pretty much everyone's top linebacker, who are some of the names that stick out? Whether it's as high as 36 or 40 for Washington, or maybe you know a little bit later, fourth, third, fourth, fifth, sixth round type of guys that could develop into future starters. The guys that you'll hear sprinkled through, Logan, help me out about the guys you have. Junior yeah. Colson, Michigan, okay? Yeah. He's going to be an Edron Cooper, Texas A&M. Trayvon Wallace from Kentucky. These are kind of the names that are kind of top, top of the food chain here. You mentioned Peyton Wilson already. That guy's just a tackling machine. His only issue is going to be depending on what team, like his medical. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've heard double-digit surgeries. Okay, and he's not even out of college yet. So that's going to be one of the things that comes up. But you turn on the tape, watch him play. Oh, I mean, yeah. right? What you looking he, for? He can rip, that. man. Yeah. He can rip. My guy, truthfully, my guy is Cedric Gray from the University of North Carolina. <laughs> I like that you said that, man. I really like him a lot. And what? so what is it that, that makes him your guy? Because when I watch him, I see a guy with good instincts. I see good ball production. And I see this, like, a good football player. I don't know if there's anything more than that that you see, but no, no, no more than that, no less than that. Down in, down out. Here's my comparison for him, and it's a he, he's not as fast because this guy could could dart. Zach Brown. Mm, I got you. Yeah, Zach, Zach, and they're both out of North Carolina, so sometimes it's a lazy comparison. <laughs> Zach, remember Zach held the ACC indoor 60 meter dash for a while. Oh wow! 
Yeah, Zach was, yeah. I covered Zach when he was here as, as right? when I was on the beat back in the day. Like, yeah, Zach remember. was a freak athlete. Um, his athleticism was his dominant trait. Um, a guy that a okay, dominant trait. Yeah, remember, he, remember, remember people said, hey, not so physical, not this, not that. But every year you'd have 100-something tackles now right. where they blow them up, you know, knock people on their butt tackles. No, not necessarily, but he made the tackles. This kid – has everything that you said, Logan. I'm totally with you on the comparison and, and, and the and the evaluation. And he showed it at the Senior Bowl during the game because he had yeah. the ball protection with a pick. You know, he made all the plays that he's supposed to make. But he's a guy that I just, you know, I really, really like. And under the radar is this kid from Temple named Jordan McGee. Mm. Yeah. Keep, an eye out. Keep an eye out for Jordan McGee because I think he's another guy that has everything that you're looking for and somehow is kind of getting overlooked in this. Mainly because one, we haven't talked about linebackers. No one has. <laughs> Two, he just you know when, when you do talk about, I'm only going to talk about a certain few because it's just not a topic that's interest to anyone this year. Yeah, hundred percent. Logan, anyone else you want to shout out real quick on your linebacker list? Uh, I mean, I'm kind of with I'm kind of with Charles here. Like there, it's the top, and then there's it gets really thin. A guy thin. A guy that I like is Maurice uh, Luafu from Notre Dame. I think oh, he's just a oh, big. Man downhill kind of dude i think he's a better athlete than people think trice knighton from utep is a guy that flashes a little bit yes right and so like those are the types of guys you're talking about and i like those guys quite a bit but again it's i think with linebackers especially this year i I don't think it's a bad class but i think stylistically you're gonna you're looking if i'm looking for a linebacker i gotta look for something very specific i gotta kind of hunt and peck for it so like for example maurice lufu is like a big thumper guy right that's not everybody's cup of tea, right? So you got to kind of say, what do we want to be defensively? What what value does he add, and does it fit our our identity? Much like you would with with uh, you know running back this year, which there are some good pieces there, but kind of what is our offensive our offensive or defensive identity with these positions? Well, I'm so glad you brought up Tyrese Knight from UTEP because I think he just made another tackle while we were talking. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's what he does, and again, he's not going to be picked very very high, right? And- Dame, since you brought up Maris, Maris uh, Leafu, yeah. don't forget his running mate, J.D. Bertrand. Yeah, right. Absolutely. The issue we have nowadays is most of the time we're playing with two linebackers max. Yeah. yeah. All right? It used That's to be a there was a point. Crazy, and then we go down and so on. And you wanted that guy in the middle, coordinate everything and the whole deal. Bertram is your perfect guy. He almost was born in the wrong era. Okay? <laughs> because – he was the perfect guy to have the dot on his helmet, coordinate everything, and be that guy. Now I think they might be wanting to take him off the field a lot more, so it's a different feel for him because he's right there in the middle. Lefo, we, they were a nice little duo working together, and I really like Bertrand. But mm. as you pointed out, Logan, what is it you're looking for each team? Sure. Because nowadays we're playing with two and one more than we're doing anything else. I mean, how often do you run running out there, Roquan Smith and Patrick Queen? Yeah. No, it's, I mean, it's because they're special guys though. And not everybody has special players at the position. And in some ways, I like, this is more, this is a more like a larger philosophical conversation, but that position, because of the demand that's placed on them in the passing game and the running game now, you need to find special players for it. And if they are special, they help your defense. I think Roquan Smith is a great example of that, but it's hard to find guys like that in the draft every year because they, it, to me, it's like quarterback. It's an above the neck position. A lot of development involved, so can be pretty challenging for sure. And Craig, I'll stop here. But you know what's going to help bring these linebackers back into the fold where they're the full time guys? When we get offensive coordinators who and, and, and franchises that literally will line up and run the football and stay with it. Yeah. yeah. And the cyclical nature of the NFL says that's coming back. The, the numbers right. are starting to suggest that 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 is. You know, the big hey, backs are the ones that are not, like if you look at the yeah. top ten rushers over the last three years, each year, I will bet you you'll find six, seven of the top ten were two twenty, two twenty five, two thirty. Right. Yeah. yeah. The bigger back, if you're gonna hurt, if you're gonna, hey, listen, you want to play light box, right? Mm. I've got that big back. I'm gonna throw him at you, and let's see if you stay. Let's see, let's see what you do with dealing with him. It's uh, it's exploiting market inefficiency. That's the nerdy way yeah. to say it. Uh, just hey, the, the 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 more straightforward is, y'all aren't very big. We're gonna be big. Yeah. Yeah. Bang, done. Thank, thank thank you for breaking that down for me. I felt like Denzel. Don't talk to me like I'm a five year old, please. Because That's, that first thing you said, I was like, okay, I didn't. I, I went to. I didn't go to Bandy. 
All right. Yeah. So thank you, Craig. I appreciate that. You, you and your, your, uh, your humility, Charles. Uh, <laughs> one, one day you're going to realize how smart you are. Charles Davis with us uh, here on Take Command. Again, Path to the Draft, weeknight, 6 p.m. You only got another week of it because uh, then, then, then the path has ended. It ends in Detroit. Yes. Uh, the NFL Draft is on NFL Network. Don't forget, Total Access has full coverage as well on NFL Network weeknights at 7. Charles, this was phenomenal. Um, if you get bored during the summer and want to come back, uh, you're you're welcome anytime, my friend. Any, any, anytime you guys are that bored and want me, this has been an absolute blast. And, yes, you're right, Craig. One week left to see where these youngsters go. I hope they all be, I hope they all are getting able to chase their Logan Paulson dream and be able to have that opportunity and go out and do it. Because, Logan, you did it so well for so long and with such class in doing it. And it's just been a blast for me to be able to sit here and talk with you. And I can't wait to stay in touch with you and Craig. You need me over the summer, I'm around, okay? We got you. That's right, kids. Dream of being undrafted like Logan Falson. (laughs) Hey, but Logan made it. And that's 10 years. I did. 10 years, baby. He made it. (laughs) He did it. He did it. Thanks for watching this clip of Take Command, which has a brand new home. That's right. You can watch on YouTube at the Team 980. You can also listen to full episodes in the free Odyssey app, which is now enabled with Apple CarPlay. So we'll just, you know, follow you around. (laughs) Ha, 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 ha.